Thanks for tuning in to All It's Quacked Up To Be, a podcast by Line Leader. I'm your host, Sierra Rossing, the head of marketing at Line Leader by Childcare CRM. In this episode, I'm joined by Matt Rogers, Chief Marketing Officer at Code Ninjas, and Megan Bowling, in charge of franchise development at Stretch and Grow International. Both Megan and Matt bring years of business development, marketing, and sales experience within the education industry. This discussion focuses primarily on the out-of-school time, after-school care, and youth enrichment markets, with an emphasis on franchise systems and international expansion. They share a lot of wisdom and insights while also revealing some of their tips on what not to do. So be sure to break out your notepad for this one and let's dive in. Thank you both for being here. Really excited to have you on. But first, before we dive into all the, the insights, trends for enriched and out of school time providers, I wanted to give you both a chance to kind of introduce yourselves, share a little bit about what each of your organizations do and how they serve children and youth. So, um, Matt, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Matt Rogers. I am the chief marketing officer at Code Ninjas. Um, we are a youth enrichment franchise specializing in coding. Uh, we have just under 400 locations across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. Amazing. And Megan, can you tell us a little bit about Stretch and Grow? Did you see the shirt, of course? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Megan Bowling. I'm with Stretch and Grow. We are a franchise system as well, specializing in movement-based and rich programs. So fitness, dance, sports, music, gymnastics at preschools, private schools, and rec centers. So have you seen the the industry change in the last 12 months in the out-of-school time and enrichment space, and maybe specific to the franchise system as well? So what I've noticed is that there are lot, a lot more options for schools now to find enrichment programs that suit their needs. And what I'm seeing, and maybe Matt, you're seeing similar, we're seeing a lot of these multi-brand kind of franchise owners purchase smaller brands and bring them under their umbrella and so that's kind of what i'm seeing in our industry is there's more and more options coming up for school yeah i think we're similar um we're primarily brick and mortar so you know i think it's one increased competition uh, both like in the digital space and in the retail space. I think two is post COVID parents had this massive swing of, we need our kids to do everything because they just spent 18 months indoors and that's starting to peel back. And I think that you know, that's partially driven by the economy. Um, you know, we have also seen that it's, that growth is very regionalized. And so part of that is economy driven. We're in an election year, all of that. So yeah, I think, but mainly increased competition and then parents being a little bit more selective with, you know, we call it like the, the share of after school hours, not wanting to kind of burn their kids out, you know, like they might've done 18 months ago coming out of COVID. I think too, it's getting more and more difficult because we're seeing more dual working income homes or single parent homes. So to get their children to after school programs has become a little bit harder as well. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do you foresee those trends continuing on? You mentioned that, you know, following pan the pandemic, that parents were really interested in getting their children into these programs and making sure that they have those opportunities. Um, and now they're becoming more selective. Do you, do you foresee them becoming more and more selective as time goes on? Or do you foresee that the pendulum kind of swinging back the other way and then starting to starting to load the, the children back out after school? I think ultimately what we might move a little bit closer to center if we're using the pendulum metaphor, but I don't think we'll ever get back to kind of that post-pandemic level. You know, whether that is driven by costs, whether that is driven by parent time, whether that is driven by, you know, just not wanting to burn kids out. You know, I think 
we have a couple of user personas that are, you know, very like academically driven. We see that continuing to grow, but kind of our other persona, they just want their kid to do something that is productive, but that the kid also wants to do. We see that parent wanting to kind of give their child more ownership over their time. And we're also seeing that happen at kind of a younger age. I think pre-pandemic, you know, kids started to control their time a little bit more in like middle school. Um, but we're starting to see, you know, kind of mid elementary school, even kids being able to say, I don't want to do this. I'm not having fun. And the parent kind of saying, okay, well, let's find something else, which I think is just a, a post pandemic behavior change. Yeah. We see them kind of sampling. We do, we work mostly with preschools. So we partner with the preschools to bring these enrichment programs. So it gives options to parents. So we might be at a school offering fitness, dance, and music, and we'll see a parent try each program and all it's all within our system so we can see that. And so they're trying to expose their children to more activities to find out what they like at an early age, which is great. That's really interesting. You, know, you mentioned it becoming more competitive, parents getting more selective, and maybe even having to appeal to the children sooner, and they're becoming yeah. more of a you know, key influencer on, on the decision-making process. Um, and you both have really great brands. You know, I love that, like Stretch and Grow, you call your students Stretch and Grow Stars. You've got each of your activities has its own kind of like brand established. And Matt, you know, Code Ninjas, obviously you've got the dojo, you know, you've got the Code Sensei with this, like the teacher, the instructor, the ninjas being the students. Do you feel like your brand, and I guess we'll start with you, Matt, do you feel like the brand has played a pivotal role in uh, remaining competitive, both to the parents and maybe also to new franchise growth. Yeah, I think brand is kind of at an interesting time because similar to what we talked about, you know, it's not just, I want my kid to be specifically for us. Like I want them to learn coding. It's, you know, I want them to learn a specific language within coding, or I want them to be specifically focused on game development or app development or building websites. So we're much more kind of in the long tail. The brand has to stand for something because I think ultimately when you try to be, you know, everything for everybody, you're nothing to nobody. But at the same time, you also have to be flexible in how you show up to the personas that you've defined. And Code Ninjas is interesting in this space is interesting because you know, we have a customer and a consumer. Um, and so the brand has to mean different things to those people as well. So I the brand needs to be a lot more flexible than it has needed to be maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and part of that is driven by the consumer. Part of that is driven by competition. Yeah. yeah, it's super interesting because we want the experience to be so amazing and so high quality for the children. But also we need to speak to the parents. So finding that balance yeah. It takes a lot of energy and effort, and we completely rebranded in 2019. And then, of course, you guys know what happened right after that. And so it, but it has truly kept us in line as we've seen extreme growth after that rebranding and kind of realigning our core values and establishing them, which really is important for staffing, is important for branding, is important for the kids too. Mm. Yeah. Well, I love that. It kind of plays into my next um, question, which was going to be, how would you suggest that other enrichment or after-school care providers balance competing priorities um, and demands within the industry, such as trying to create maybe a parent-centric marketing approach versus a child-centric marketing approach or growth or versus program quality loss? Like how... How have you all kind of found the the balance there to make, ensure the integrity of your brand um, while, you know, making sure that, of course, like company objectives and goals are being met? And Megan, we can start with you. So for us, it all comes down to del delivery, really, and making sure that our staff understands the components of each class and what must happen in each and every class. We have certain things that speak to our brand that happens in the delivery. And then that way the children go back to their parents and tell them how amazing it was, but then also having certain material to support that. So we do handouts and newsletters to keep the parents involved and engaged. So making sure that there's kind of two parts, right? That you're sharing with the parents what the children are doing, but also ensuring that those 
classes are so fun and so high quality for the children. Yeah, I think it's for us, it is understanding what you are willing to compromise and what you're not willing to compromise on. It's like we're not willing to compromise on our curriculum. You know, we have our standard curriculum that needs to be delivered in the way it needs to be delivered. So a student has the same experience across our nearly 400 locations, and they're actually learning what they say that we're going to be learning. But then there's other things that we are willing to compromise on, whether that's clubs or birthday parties or our summer camp. And so, you know, I think those those kind of tangen tangential products, you know, we can have a little bit more flexibility and we can use those to kind of drive that additional growth or to uh, help us expand to a new customer or a new consumer and kind of how those come to life. So that's kind of how we, we think about that growth is, you know, we know we're not going to compromise on our pedagogy. We're not going to compromise on our curriculum. We're not going to compromise on how we teach and the importance of learning to code. But we also know that's not for everybody. Um, and, you know, some kids still want to come and find their place and be around people, but not necessarily learn like that rigorous coding every single no. Could you, um, you know, talking about tangential experiences and offering like innovative programs in the space, Matt, um, the Prodigy program that you all are running is very interesting. And I know you just yeah. had a really big event. I believe it was last month, actually, in the DFW area. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we do a lot with partnerships. Um, you know, I find that they're a great way to kind of elevate our brand. Um, you know, it also helps that we have 100,000 kids that will come through our doors that are interested in STEM because a lot of other companies are kind of struggling to find STEM talent or struggling to um, recruit and stay relevant to younger and younger kids. So we created the Prodigy program last year and it basically, you know, it had started as our way to kind of introduce our ninjas to kind of the largest technology and gaming companies. Code Ninjas is really rooted in gaming. We use gaming for a lot of our like ways to teach code. Um, and so it kind of started as that, you know, come to Code Ninjas, you know, you'll get, a, you know, a behind the scenes tour at kind of the largest in tech technology and gaming companies. Our first partner was with Microsoft. So we had eight winners from our different regions. Uh, U.S., Canada, and the U.K., we flew them to Microsoft HQ. They got to spend a whole day there. They got to go and play with the Xbox games that are being developed, talk to the Minecraft team, meet the Make Code team, which is the platform that our, a lot of our coding classes are built on. And so that was super fun. The last one, you know, we pivoted the program a little bit to also include like the non-traditional routes that learning to code can take you. So this one was with a company called Sky Elements, which is the largest drone show company in the world. So we selected eight winners again from the US, UK, and Canada. Uh, we flew them into Dallas. They got to work with the company to like help code the drone show um, and like have a portion of the drone show kind of come to life with their imagination. So we had, like 400 drones flying. So it was super fun. And I think it's, you know, one, it's allowed us to kind of partner with companies that are, you know, above our weight class, for lack of a better term. Um, but also uh, give our, you know, the, the community and the dojo community is something that's super important to us. Um, and doing things like this allow us to kind of continually build and reinforce that community um, and really just celebrate our ninjas that uh, are, you know, they're creating these amazing games. And we just want to kind of elevate that experience for everybody. Amazing. I love that. You know, one industry trend that came out of our benchmark report that we released in January, and we did a survey of 5,000 Childhood education and enrichment providers. And we find that personalization is definitely like a rising trend among parents. You know, they are shopping increasingly local and really looking for those like very personalized and just meaningful experiences with brands that they're choosing to spend their money and their time with. And um, I feel like the Crotigy program sounds like a, you know, a great way to um, obviously deliver a really meaningful experience for a child, something that, you know, they're going to remember for the rest of their life. Uh, but also be able to do it at scale, right? Because you can't send everyone to Washington, D.C. You can't send everyone to Dallas. But um, I love that, you know, you're keeping like that competitive aspect of it and really having them work towards a goal, um, which is, of course, super important, you know, in children's development. And then just also being able to craft a really meaningful experience. Have you seen any, you know, growth or marketing enrollment trends come out of stretching or money, whether it's personalization or our parents wanted to speak with the coaches before they enroll their children or anything like that? Sure, definitely. And especially because our classes do happen at schools. 
they don't get to actually see the classes. Uh, we do showcases and then we do recitals for our dance program. But until then, they really, they don't get to see what's happening. And so very often they'll want to hear from their coach. We send home emails. We send home progress reports and things like that. We definitely see that. What we've really seen is a need in the early childhood education industry to support the schools. And so that's been a huge huge growth thing for us because we've stepped in to help with teacher breaks and and stuff like that so we have more and more schools partnering with us where they we it's a partnership program where we see everyone in the school so we don't get any interaction with the, the parents for those programs so again it's just we have to continuously send home information so that we can reach the parent. I love um, that you mentioned stepping in for teacher breaks because, of course, we have seen retention continues to be an issue, I think, in all aspects of education, but especially in the, um, you know, within early childhood development. So that is a really interesting way that a center could kind of step in and, and provide a benefit back to their staff. About how long are the breaks? Like, how long are your classes, you know, if a center was looking to promote that yeah they're 30 minutes so all of our all of our classes are curriculum based as well so our coaches are certified they have their background checks they have their cpr certification everything that would allow them to kind of be the star of the show to give the teacher that break to wipe tables down go to the bathroom do lesson plans whatever it is and so after covid it was really interesting because we saw a huge expansion in that schools would say can you come two or three days a week because they were having a hard time staffing their centers and giving staff those breaks so it's really been interesting to watch that because kind of pre-covid our parent paid or paid or voluntary programs were larger and now we've seen a shift into this kind of center-wide partnership to support the schools Interesting. Are there any mistakes either of you have seen you know, executives or even maybe franchise owners make when that's something they keep up with industry trends or, you know, trying to be kind of like the first one to do something in their space? Um, just anything that you would recommend that they, people avoid as they look to grow and scale their business? Wait, first time again? Sure. Um, I think for us, we, for us, we've, we've had this over the last 30 years. Um, and it's really important to have KPIs and expectations and and invest in professional development for your leaders and make sure that you're continuously pouring into them and leading them in a way that aligns with their core values and your core values. Um, that's a big mistake that we have seen that people kind of come into this sector and just they do it themselves, but then as they hire people on, they don't put the time into them to make sure that they're going to continuously de deliver the quality that they want. Yeah, I think Code Ninjas is interesting uh, from a franchisee perspective because we have a lot of mission-driven owners, which is amazing because it meant we didn't close a lot of locations during COVID despite kind of having to go remote and everything that happened during that. Uh, but that also means that you know, there's a lot of weaknesses around things like marketing and sales, right? And at the end of the day, we are a sales and marketing organization. Like that's how we get students in the door. Um, so we've had to do a lot of training on marketing and a lot of training on like actually closing the deals with parents. So I think that's one, you know, similar to training, but it's higher, slow and fire fast. I think like toxicity can very quickly turn a, you know, raw small teams can turn a small team sour, especially because you know, Code Ninjas is only seven or eight years old. So, you know, as you grow, your needs changed. And it's important to kind of recognize that the needs of the company have changed. And if that person's skill set no longer fits that needs, then like it's okay to end. You don't, there's no point in kind of dragging that out. Um, so I think that that has been something that, you know, like we've, we've learned as kind of going through that process and then not tailoring kind of our communications and styles specifically to the customer, like everything needs to start with the customer and the consumer. And I think a lot of people that, you know, I've talked to or mentored over the years, you know, just because you have a great idea or just because you have a great product, if you don't know who the customer is and you're not speaking to that customer, talking to them where they want to be spoken to, being part of the conversations that they're a part of you're gonna really struggle to kind of see the growth 
Um, and then understanding not just kind of who your current set of customers are, but who's your core customer and how are you building and shaping and changing the message for that customer versus your current set of customers. And being really clear on who your ideal customers are and how ideal staff members yeah. are as well. Yeah, the, um, you know, making sure you have the right people on the bus, um, yeah. kind of the, you know, all those great metaphors, um, I feel like are something that can be hard, especially for like a, a small business owner um, who's in the center every single day building relationships with those staff, you know, day after day, year after year. Um, and I actually love to quote the great Beth Cannon, who's a instructor <laughs> go franchise owner, um, a great partner of ours. She uh, explained it at a conference recently. I was like, I'm re-gifting people to the universe. <laughs> like, I'm helping yeah. them on their best possible path and move forward and you know, what's going to serve them best while also making sure that, you know, you're serving your business and your other staff best, right? Because you don't want to do a disservice to to your star um, staff members who maybe are having to pick up extra slack and, and things like that. Definitely. I'm, I'm seeing her tonight. We start training new franchisees today. So I'm going to let her know that you said that. She also has another quote. Um, you can't, don't burn your great staff members by putting up with the ones that maybe aren't following your, your company's core values and align because that yeah. will definitely affect your team. Yeah. yeah. And the next question I wanted to ask you all about, and again, it's just, you know, perfect is to hang down. Um, was, are there any dangers that you consider to be associated with rapid business growth specific to this industry? I mean, staff, you know, could be one right there of, um, you know, being so afraid to let bodies go because you have to stay in ratio or you have to make sure that there's someone watching, you know, a child in every aspect of your business. Um, and there's more and more children coming in that you're just like kind of letting them ride it out and, you know, waiting to solve that problem later. But are there any other issues you've come up, whether you're experienced with your current organizations and other organizations or just seeing like other operators, what pitfalls are there to rapid business growth? I mean, our industry, the safety is so, so important. And so making sure that you're not just hiring to put bodies in places, yeah. that you are taking the time to find quality people that you know are going to be safe with the children and making sure they get get all of their certifications and staying in touch with them because for us, our coaches are going after those schools. So we don't see them every day. We don't get to see their classes. So making sure you're dropping in, checking in on them, staying in touch with them and that everyone's being safe is the biggest priority for us. Yeah, I think staffing is obviously hard. I think from you know the franchisee perspective, I think when you're prioritizing growth, it's sometimes hard to be really strict with kind of who you want in, you know, like when you, when you see a territory and you see the opportunity to sell that territory, it's making sure that, you know, you're partnering with the right person. Like we see it very much as a partnership with our franchisee. I think that one. And I think the other thing, like from a, a franchise or perspective is making sure that you have the systems in place that will allow you to scale. Um, and that usually means kind of over investing in the beginning, because at some point you're going to get to a place where you've outgrown your systems. And when you've outgrown your systems, it becomes very, very difficult to change. And that change as you grow is, you know, even more taxing for the franchisees. If you're constantly rolling out, you know, new billing and scheduling platforms or new CRMs or new, you know, XYZ, um, like that can be very taxing to a system, especially one that is experiencing kind of that you know massive growth uh when you're kind of in that mode yeah growing okay. responsibly is super important we back in the day my dad did not qualify people when he started stretch and grow with my mom and so we ended up with some franchisees that maybe weren't the best fit for our system and that that was hard and that's something that my since my sister and i have taken over we have been really, really clear about that. We don't want, you know, just anyone to be representing Stretch and Grow. We want to find the right people who this is going to make a great impact in their life, but also they understand our mission and, and all of that. You mentioned that you have a training tonight, Megan, which is awesome. I'm sure that's one really big pillar of ensuring consistency and career quality across, you know, a franchise organization. When again, like you said, you can't be there in person every single day with everybody. 
um, what does a training process look like for stretch and grow for a new owner or even for the coaches themselves? Sure. So to start out, a new owners come to Florida. We do the five day training. Um, Beth is our lead trainer internationally. So she comes, I'm here. And then some of my, cause I run a franchise here in St. Pete, Florida as well. So some of my coaches are mom in the training. They have it, class time. Uh, we go pitch schools. We do a lot of classroom training, things like that. Then afterwards, it's a series of Zoom calls to set them up. They have an option to fly out, out, out one of our territory reps if needed. Um, but then we do monthly webinars to continue training. We also do, so for the coaches, the coaches is a lot of hands-on training. We have certifications that they have to get through Stretch and Grow, but it's up to the franchisees to actually do their classroom training. And so it's going to try to depend on someone's experience, but it's usually around three to four weeks of them training, following coaches, and then they begin to start taking over classes and you kind of trickle, trickle off there. And that's how you, you train them. And then it's continuously making sure that they're doing professional development, making sure that you're dropping in one of the classes, we following the lesson plans. They need to follow the lesson plans every week. We provide them with their lesson plans, with their curriculum or with their um, equipment, with their music, all of the things. So making sure that they're using all of the resources available to them for the coaches and for the franchisees. So that's that's kind of how we do it in Star Trek. Right? Matt, would you say it's, it's similar at Code Ninjas or what does that onboarding process look like typically? Yeah, it's very similar. Um, we have our NFT new franchisee training. That's why, actually why I'm in Atlanta right now. Um, that's a five day program. Um, and then we have our franchise business partners, which are kind of our operations team. Um, and they work with them on, you know, kind of the, the continuous training. Um, so, you know, then that, that new franchise training goes through the curriculum, it goes through all of our system. And, you know, like we talked about earlier, like that's what we're very strict on. Um, and then we allow, you know, then we allow more flexibility at kind of those ancillary programs. So if we have owners that are, you know, super passionate about avionics and they want to create, you know, an a avionics club, sure. We love that. Um, cause I think that like allowing people to you know, show that passion is where you get kind of the best result. But yeah, so it's very, very kind of similar. Love that. We embrace creativity as well. Stores and Grove has started as just the fitness program. And over the last 30 years, we've had amazing franchisees who've been super creative like that. Yeah. And that's how we've been able to grow into different programs. And we're being a little bit flexible is super important when we're international. Right. I can agree because we see different kind of different means in different places. So yeah, it looks just a little bit different everywhere. Yeah. yeah. That's something I didn't think about, but I'm sure like, of course, different cultures and languages and, you know, there's so many different dynamics that play into it when you're operating internationally. Um, so it's great that both your systems have found ways to incorporate new, fresh ideas. I'm sure that's been a big part of how you able to remain competitive and also innovate um and probably build really really great partnerships with your franchise owners as well definitely that's awesome yeah um so we one rising trend that we've started to identify and um was actually called out in um article in exchange press in february um which is the top 50 for profit report because they're kind of like the top top trends facing the top 50 operators in early childhood education is that while Finding staff isn't necessarily the huge concern anymore. We're kind of like moved out of that. Um, a lot of the staff that operators are finding is greener and um, maybe doesn't have quite as much experience, you know, overseeing children and, you know, ha having uncomfortable conversations with parents and, or, um, you know, just even reporting to someone else in general, you know, this might be their first time entering the workforce. Is that something that either of you have experienced or that your franchise owners have experienced at all? The interesting thing with coding is, you know, there is an inherent stereotype with somebody that wants to do computer programming. Um, and so our biggest issue isn't necessarily, you know, that they're greener or not, but it is that the 
the personality type that wants to engage with parents and wants to, you know, get down at eye level with a child and walk them through the problem that they're having or go to the whiteboard and draw so that they can visualize it in a different way um, is stereotypically a very different personality than the person who like just is naturally drawn to coding. Um, so kind of where we've struggled and what we kind of tried to do with the curriculum is um, make it so that you don't actually have to know how to code um, and you become much more of like the cheerleader archetype where like you really like the kid walks in, you're so excited to see them, you're yelling their name, you're getting them to jump up and down. You know, you want the kid to be happier when they're leaving than when they walk in the door. Um, so that's really where we've struggled with staffing. Interesting. Yeah. Um, for us, it's it's finding the right staff members. It has become more difficult with the way that these kind of job boards are operating now. And there are so many options. Um, and like you, we need a certain type of personality. We need people who are going to be comfortable acting like elephants with 24 year olds, you know, in front of teachers and stuff. And so they does take a minute to find the right personality. And we have spent a lot of time and effort on making it so simple, like Matt, for these coaches that I think that once we find them, then we're good, we're golden, but that's the, the difficult thing, bro. Yeah. Has, you know, you mentioned, um, and I don't know how you're managing this, Megan, but you mentioned, Matt, that for you all, you know, you've kind of built a curriculum that doesn't necessarily require the code sensei to know how to code. Um, and they can kind of be like that cheerleader archetype, which I love, you know, that term. Um, and I imagine a lot of that is because maybe the child is like using some piece of technology to kind of walk through problems and then... Um, they're being coached to, to, you know, progress and move through that at kind of like a piece that, you know, fits their learning style, I assume. But um, Megan, I don't know if you all have leaned on technology at all, but in, in that way to help kind of like the coaches maybe get their curriculum or like focus on like, okay, this is my lesson plan for the day. I have it really accessible on my phone or on a tablet or something like that. But do you, you know, are there any new ways um, you've seen technology play a role in whether it's the staffing component, how children are learning, how you're communicating with parents, you know, how is technology making an impact on your business? Well, for us, we used to, we used to source different benefits. So for example, we have our enrollment system, we have our scheduling system, we have our curriculum system. So all of it is on their on phone. Of course, of course. And especially in our coaches are typically on the younger side. So we want it to be super easy for them to get all the things they need. We actually are about to launch our own app within our system that will handle all of our curriculum and eventually all of the things that the coaches need. But we rely heavily on an, an enrollment system. And so that's something that's very interesting that I see that some of my competitors don't do. They still do paper enrollments in the schools. And I can't, I think nowadays you have to have a virtual system where parents can go in and simply register and count yeah, them. Matt, have you seen any new ways that, you know, either Coop Ninjas as a corporation or franchise systems have been relying on technology outside of the obvious one, of course, like, <laughs> you know, teaching kids how to code. I think that the interesting, ways that owners are using technology in the areas that they're most passionate about um whether that you know is as simple as you know rubik's cubes right like there's now digital rubik's cubes that they've created clubs around that teach kids how to solve a rubik's cube that are super fun or the way that they use the tvs in their dojos so i think like that that's where the interesting technology is for me it's kind of again in that long tail of customers and giving them kind of what they're interested in versus like our, our sign-on process is all fairly digital at this point um you know we we generally have we call them tech enabled parents that they themselves are in the industry um and i think if we made them sign up on a piece of paper they would not think that we were very cutting edge yeah. You know, it's interesting to think about the progression of technology. So when Stretch and Grow was started and they would come train, my parents would give them 
a box of like a Rolodex and then a box of tapes that they would play their music on. And so that's been something that's very interesting to watch the progression of the music apps and the curriculum apps and all of those things. So it's, I mean, you have to stay on top of that to remain competitive. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the other interesting thing with technology. Like, it allows you to deliver a personalized experience at mm -hmm. scale. You know, AI is, AI is the buzzword of 2023 <laughs> and 2024. Um, and I, you know, it's still very much in its infancy, but it is a, giving even kind of individuals the, the ability to personalize at scale, um, which is... I don't think we're quite at the disruption level yet, but it's we're we're borderline on the disruption. Yeah, it's also offering ways to simplify and streamline. CRM systems are huge now, so that's that's also created kind of a thing though because parents and school directors are bombarded with information all day. Lots of it now is AI written, so it's almost you know it's. It's done a lot of great things, but it's also caused some kind of interesting brand recognition problems. Oh, it's yeah. When when every single person can go make whatever version of your logo that they want in, you know, X AI bot, and then I have to spend all my time reinforcing brand guidelines. <laughs> yeah. It's not what I thought I'd be spending a lot of my time doing, but here we are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Brand guidelines, yeah, ours are newer too. So back in the day, it used to be just use whatever colors you want. And, you know, there was no no guidelines for a long time. So I can definitely understand your frustration on brand guidelines. Yeah, I think, well, I can say even in the SaaS company where we're all operating under like one corporate entity, um, we still have issues with brand guidelines. So I think a universal problem. <laughs> yeah. There's just so much out there now that I really appreciate you both joining me. And um, I wanted to give you each kind of an opportunity, you know, to um, share if there's anything else you feel like I didn't ask you, or if there's anything that you'd like to promote for Code Ninjas Mad or Mining for Stretch and Grow, or, you know, whether there's new franchise opportunities, new territories opening up, or programs for, for families to come and be a part of. We relaunched franchising last year, and so we are opening up new territories, and we, if anyone's interested in opening up a territory that, or if you're a school director that, that is looking to outsource physical education classes, or maybe give your teachers a break, you can go to our website, which is stretchandgrow.com. We would love to talk with you and all the information is there. Well, we are also open. We have a lot of open territories right now. Um, you can go to our website, which is codeninches.com. Um, I think for us, what's been really interesting that we've spent, you know, the first part of this year and really the second half as well is how we think about um, like new revenue streams for our owners. Um, you know, we are brick and mortar, but we're only open four hours a day on weekdays and eight hours a day on weekends. So there's a lot of unused hours. Um, so how can we, whether that's through homeschooling, whether that's through school partnerships, like how can we give our owners opportunities for on brand, um, but additional revenue streams, um, you know, summer camps, spring break camps, all of that's fairly standard, but you know, our big focus is what else can we do to kind of help up our AUVs, help up, um, you know, because I think we're we're also in the age of retail where it's, it's starting to get more expensive. Um, and so a lot of our, you know, franchisees um, rents are starting to go up more. Um, and so profitability is huge for us as we focus on that. So that's a big focus for us this year is how can we kind of continue to grow the different revenue streams. Um, yeah, and summer camps are just a couple of weeks away, depending on where you are. Thanks again to Matt and Megan for joining me on this episode of All It's Quacked Up To Be. If you're like me, you may be thinking, wow, that was amazing. I need to go back, listen again, and jot down all my action items and takeaways for my own business. Not to fear, I've put together a recap on the Line Leader blog, available at blog.lineleader.com. And I've got a few nuggets for you to depart with right now. First, think about your ideal customer persona. How have they changed in the last 12 to 18 months? Are there new key influencers or decision makers moving to the forefront? 
The best way to understand this is by getting face-to-face -face time with your franchise owners and enrollment teams who are on the front line speaking to inquiring families every day. Next, how are you maintaining your brand integrity? Everything from ensuring all your locations are using the right colors and logos, to keeping with the correct brand tone and voice in email follow-ups to parents, to delivering consistent curriculum and safety standards are integral to standardization and scaling successfully. Finally, training and coaching don't end after the franchise owner signs on the dotted line. Invest in professional development for your owners and their staff to ensure longevity for your business. Plus, all that quality interaction with your franchisees on a regular basis can lead to greater information sharing, which could contribute to innovation and differentiating your business from the competition like it has for Matt and Megan. Until next time, make sure to rate and subscribe so you never miss another episode.